The BS Report is a free-flowing conversation that occasionally touches on mature subjects. First of all, this is the BS Report with Bill Simmons. It might be cool, I don't know. And if it's not, I don't care. The BS Report with Bill Simmons. Bill Simmons works for ESPN. He's also named the sports guy. And he writes a comical sports column. You must be a popular dude. The BS Report. It's got a real dirty sound, like a rusty steak knife cutting through a well-aged steak. No. 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 Here's Bill Simmons. Yeah. Welcome to the BS Report. A sunny day here in Southern California. Not a sunny day in Middle Connecticut for our friend Jacko, who, uh, is the anti-fan for the UConn programs. We're going to call him right now and just let him vet. He does know we're calling this time. Let's try. Complex litigation. This is John. Oh, Johnny. What's up, Willie? How you feeling? <laughs> I feel good. I feel all right. UConn, is, UConn yeah. is dominating college basketball, and the Red Sox are prohibitive ALE's favorites. Prohibitive, Johnny. It's troubling it's, it's troubling times in that regard yes no doubt about it it's a tough time to be in connecticut when the men and the women are ascendant in basketball yeah it's, it's like it's like being in a cult basically living in connecticut but i'm the only one that's not in the cult so it's especially hard for me because i uh well hold on let's set this up all right so you have some passion and views about uh about uconn the men and the women program and and their place, not only in, in Connecticut, but in the sports culture and in your life. <laughs> and those views may not reflect the views of the BS Report or Bill Simmons. <laughs> I'm, de- I'm removing myself from this immediately. But, uh, in case you, you ever be- want to do a podcast with, uh, with uh, Ray Allen or Jim Calhoun or something. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> when this uh, takes off on first take for a week and they're just continually talking about your comments and getting other sides of it. Um, so anyway, do uh, do your UConn rant because it's really this really bothers you. Well, it's, I mean, it's funny because as you well know, I'm a big booster of the state of Connecticut. I mean, when we were in college, I used to annoy everybody because if there was actors or athletes that were on television at the time, and I'd be like, "Oh, he's from Connecticut," or "She's from Connecticut," to the point of annoyance. So it's kind of odd that I don't like UConn, but for whatever reason, I I just really do not like the University of Connecticut, and I don't understand why one roots for a college that they did not attend, mm. as happens in this state. I went to Holy Cross. I root, My favorite college basketball team is the Holy Cross Crusaders. Now, granted, they don't play at the level. They're not in the Big East. They don't play at the level of UConn, so I can understand maybe you'd have some affinity for some school that played at a higher level than yours or was more successful. But, I mean, you got to be true to your school. I know a plethora of people who did not go to UConn and refer to UConn as R or we or say to me, are you going to watch the game tonight? The game, like it's the only game in town. Yeah. So it's just so over the top, and it's the, it's the biggest bandwagon hop in the world because when I was in high school, my buddies and I, we had season tickets to Hartford's own Civic Center to all the – UConn used to play all of its Big East games there. This is before they had the Gamble Pavilion, their new field house basically, or new gym. 10,000 seat arena that they have on campus. I say new, it was open 20 years ago, but in high school it didn't exist. So they played all of their Big East games at the Civic Center, and my buddies and I had like season tickets to go see those. So you'd see them play Georgetown, Syracuse, all the Big East teams that were big at the time. And let me tell you, tickets were very available mm. because UConn, from the time it came into the Big East, was brutal. They were terrible. And they were terrible in the Big East. One of my fondest memories was going to a game. I think they played Villanova sometime in the late 80s, sometime between like 86 and 88 when we had tickets. And they used to have this tradition from the Yankee Conference where UConn fans would stand at the beginning of the game. I don't know if they still do that. They would stand until UConn scored. Yeah. And Villanova opened the game on like a 12-0 run. <laughs> it was fantastic. It was like it was like five, six minutes into the game. Finally, fans just started to sit down. <laughs> so great. It was so embarrassing for UConn. It was so pathetic. And then, of course, they bring in Calhoun, and they get to be good. Mm. And, of course, everybody loves UConn now. Like, you can't walk down the street without seeing UConn jackets and sweatshirts. And my favorite thing ever was when they, they had – they got this guy from Israel, Nadav Hennefeld. He was, like, their first big star in the Calhoun era. And I guess they won the NIT in 88 – and then they went on a big run in the NCAA tournament when we were in college in 1990, the famous Tate George shot that he hit with, you know, no time on the buzzer or whatever it was. It was like a baseball pass down the court. And yeah. He hits a big shot to put them in there. And 
they lost in the Elite Eight to, I forget who, maybe the Duke. And I remember coming home from college that summer and looking at a bookstore, and I was looking for just looking around, and there was a book there, and it said, Dream Season, The Road to the Elite Eight. <laughs> ridiculous <laughs> book in the history of mankind. It probably sold out in Connecticut. <laughs> and it was just so ridiculous. And nobody remembers this now because they've won two championships. But for about a decade there, Calhoun was known as like a huge choker. Yeah. Because they had huge teams that were highly touted and highly rated, and he could never get to the Final Four. Even with all kinds of prospects, and they were a national, you know, na- recruited nationally and internationally by that point, and he could never get to the big game. And I think part of my bitterness stems from the fact that I used to always say to people, well, the only college in New England that won an NCAA championship was Holy Cross. Yeah. And then they took that all away from me in 1999, so that was hurtful. I like that you were the last person alive keeping keeping alive the uh, <laughs> UConn Holy Cross basketball rivalry. Right. Even I gave up on that one. <laughs> well, who could forget the 1947 championship, you know? Yeah. I, <laughs> the game was not televised because there was no television. But well, still. I... So uh, here's my counter to yeah. everything you just said. Oh, and one 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 other point, one other mm-hmm. one other source of my Yukon bitterness yeah. is that I partially blame them for the Whalers leaving the state because as you know, I was always a huge Hartford Whalers guy, yeah. Hartford Whalers fan, and it's the only major league sports franchise that the state has ever had or ever will have. And I remember being in my car in the 90s, and a Whalers game, and I, not that I would listen to hockey games on the radio, I wasn't quite that pathetic, but I remember being someplace, and I said, oh, I want to see what the Whalers are doing, and I put on the local AM station that would cover their game, and it was preempted because of a UConn game. Mm. Now, now, as big as the college is, you cannot preempt your only major league sports team because of a college game. You just can't do that. But we did it here in Connecticut. It's, that's, and, that's one of the worst things I've ever heard, Johnny. So I partially blame them for the loss of the whale. So that's that's one of the sources of my bitterness as well. Okay, yeah, because that was going to be one of my counters to your bitterness. And the other thing is that it was a little bit like the Rocky Four when the Whalers died, a part yeah. of me died, but now you're the one, UConn. Yes. And everybody just shifted all of their love and affection for sports toward UConn, which which you took personally. Exactly. That that bothered me too. And I mean, I suppose a little bit of that is a natural outgrowth of the fact that basketball is a more popular sport than hockey. And people yep. grow up, you know, playing basketball. Fewer people skate or play hockey or understand the intricacies of the game. So I can understand you, you're, you know, you're more into, into basketball. But I'll never quite be able to wrap my head around the notion of rooting for a college that you didn't attend to that level. Okay, so let's. So you've you've set the seeds now for your UConn bitterness. Now, yes. um, at the same time as all of this is unfolding, <laughs> yes. You have arguably the two testiest, uh, hardest to let coaches in all of basketball, women or men, Jim exactly. Calhoun and Gino Ariema, two of the most arrogant, uh, holier than thou. Like, oh. I mean, it's like they they try to continually outdo each other to see who can be a bigger, you know what? Exactly. Um, what's that like to be living in that as well, these I mean, that guys makes, are revered? That makes it even worse because I mean the two of them are 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 a uh, huge fish in a small pond. Yep. So they have their own private fiefdoms. But, the, but uh, so, uh, you know, I, I totally get that. You're the big man on campus, literally, and there's two of them. I mean, one of the little hidden factors is the fact that they hate each other. Yep. Because if the other one didn't exist, they'd be the big kahuna in town. And because they're both there, they have to share the limelight, and their over, overweening arrogance and greed that has to sicken them that they're not the only guy in town, that they both have to be mentioned in the same breath. Right. That drives them insane. But, I mean, they're both known for the petulant, imperious press conference where, like, if anybody dares to question them about anything. Oh, they go bonkers. They go bonkers with a snarky, short response. But the press is kind of like, you know, the frat in Animal House. Thank you, sir. May I have another? Because yeah. they love them so much and the attention that it, that it brings and, and it, the way it galvanizes the state. So I literally think at this point that Calhoun or Oriema could commit a murder for sport. And the state would just shrug its shoulders and be like, that's all right. It's Calhoun or Gino, it's okay. It doesn't matter. Well, I mean, think what would happen if Calhoun was ever in some sort of cheating scandal. How fast that would get cut. Oh, wait a second. <laughs> Did that exactly. happen? Exactly. I mean, not to mention, I mean, the, you know, the program, while it's not quite the UNLV level of the 1990s, I just watched the HBO documentary about mm. Arcadia and the UNLV. Um, you know, they, they have a horrible graduation rate for the basketball team. Right. 
They well, hey, well, who cares about graduation rate? It's only college. It's only the whole reason to go. Exactly. <laughs> and, you know, not to mention the whole Nate Miles thing where we, we like, Gal- we laud Calhoun, and he's the golden boy um, for everything he does. But then when the Nate Miles deal comes out and they have all these improper relationships with their former manager who's now an agent. Well, why don't, can you recap that for us for the people who don't, who Blocked it out of their mind. Yeah, Nate Miles was some big, highly touted recruit. I forget if he was a, from high school or junior college, but colleges were salivating over him, and Calhoun was salivating over him more than others for some reason. And the UConn was really into into them, and they had this guy that used to be a manager on the team, and he was connected with, um, I think he was buddies with Richard Hamilton, actually, former UConn great. And somehow he got into sports representation through that, through Hamilton, because he could meet all the players, and through being a manager at UConn. And part of that, he became kind of like a, I think he wanted to be kind of like a Sonny Vaccaro type of a guy that like ferries players to big-time college programs, but specifically as a pipeline to UConn. Right. And you, and Calhoun's assistants, I guess specifically this guy Tom Moore, who's now the head coach at Quinnipiac and supposedly was always the heir apparent for Calhoun, he, he, like, called and texted Nate Miles, and they violated whatever the NCAA rules were. I think it was kind of like a Bruce Pearl deal where they, like, went back and forth and, and contacted him too much and were, like, all over him, and it was sort of shady the way they approached it. They finally get Nate Miles to go to UConn. <clears throat> He's at UConn for, like, 10 minutes. He gets involved with a woman and immediately has, like, a domestic violence situation with her. Oh, boy. And then... Literally, he got a restraining order in court, and and it was a no contact. He couldn't contact her in any way, shape, or form. He's walking out of the courthouse, and he calls her on his cell phone. Oh no! <laughs> Gets rearrested literally within like half an hour, and UConn did everything it could to like cover it up and and basically slough it off and do what they could to keep him at the school. So Calhoun, who's Mister, uh, it's my program. I run everything. Then suddenly was like, well, it was all my assistants, and I didn't know what was going on, and you know, oh, kind of a kind of a Watergate situation. I didn't know what my aides were doing, you know. Well, what was what was the one where he said, "We may have broken rules, but we didn't cheat." Yeah, that was this one. Oh, that was this one. Okay, that's one of the great quotes ever. And after, at first, he tried to. First, of course, he put up a big stone wall, and we're going to fight it, and it's all ridiculous, and how dare they besmirch my character. And then it came out that, you know, he was dirty and he got this slap. Well, first you kind of did the classic, we're going to investigate ourselves. Yeah, that's how it's Hire lawyers and do it. It cost the state about a million bucks in legal fees mm. to hire lawyers and come out and say, like, we were really bad and, you know, have some minor penalties that we self-imposed, hoping that would get the NCA off their back, which never works. And so then the NCA came out, but they gave him like a slap on the wrist. He can't coach, I think it's like three games next year. Yeah, that's, sure well, that'll like, teach him, though. I'm not even sure if it's like Big East games or if it's uh, all their games. So he'll sit out against like, you know, Long Island University or Central Connecticut or something. And I think they got some scholarships revoked or something. But, you know, no postseason bans, no no stripping of wins or anything major. He didn't get fired. And then he came out after like four days with his lawyer. And he does this mea culpa. It's all my fault. It was all me. I take full responsibility. But I'm still But then an asterisk. I'm still going to appeal the decision. I mean, it's just, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And his most ridiculous recent one is the state of Connecticut has like a $3 billion budget shortfall. So they're talking about layoffs and raising our taxes and all these sacrifices. And so this guy who's kind of an activist asked Calhoun, you know, you make like $2 million bucks plus incentives, plus he has a Nike contract and everything else. Any thought of you maybe taking like a symbolic pay cut? And Calhoun did this like beat his chest, imperial, not one dime. <laughs> You know, thanks, Jim. Would stand up for us there, buddy. <laughs> well, what about the graduation rates are like even worse than normal for a Division One? I'm good. Yeah, they're brutal. I know it came out before the NCAA tournament where they, you know, the Princeton Review or some college study group did a thing about they looked at all the teams in the NCAA tournament and it was like rating them by graduate, you know, reseeding them by graduation rates and. UConn's was like abysmal. It was really bad. And their excuse for that is, well, we have a lot of guys leave early that go pro. But, the, uh, you know, um, there's not not everybody on the team is going is going to the NBA early. Yeah, it said the graduation rate is below the disgraceful thirty <laughs> percent mark. That yeah. is like the normal thing. I I mean, this speaks to a whole bigger thing about what oh, the hell sure. is college sports, and it's like, what I don't I still nobody's ever been able to fully explain to me what the point of college sports is when the players don't graduate. Well, and to counter this would be well, a lot of people don't graduate college, but like. 
Not to, those, they, not to that. Not, not 70 percent of people that enter college don't graduate. Well, Hench and I had our had our uh, baseball draft yesterday, and we were talking about Kentucky, which made the Final yeah. Four. And they lost, you know, their best five guys basically All from last drafted. year. And now they're in the Final Four again. And Hench is like, it's basically like last year's team had a car accident. <laughs> And everybody True. died. It was like we are Marshall, and the, and Marshall won again the next year, which is a whole new set of guys. Like that's college basketball. It's pretty amazing. It's, it's a really. reset it's an amazing button. Amazing job by Calipari to lose all five guys and get and go to the Final Four with five new guys. Why can't we all just admit college sports is a farce? It oh, really it is. is a it's farce. A, it's a cesspool. It's ridiculous. Hey, the one thing they could do that they would never ever do is tie the scholarships to the graduation rates. Oh yeah. And if you so, don't graduate so many, you lose scholarships or whatever. Yeah, so you have to graduate half of your players. If you don't graduate half of your players, you lose, you know, with a certain amount of scholarships tied to that. If you graduate more than 50%, you get an extra scholarship. Like, you know, everybody piles on Duke and kills Duke, but mm. Duke should be rewarded for the fact that those kids end up a lot of the time graduate. I don't know the exact numbers, but it's got to be over 30%. Well, you know, it's funny <clears throat> watching the tournament this year, and I used to be a huge college basketball guy. Like, I loved college basketball yeah. when I was in high school and even into when we were in college. And part of it was because you got to know the guys. They were there for four years, like Chris yeah. Mullen and Patrick Ewing. Now, part of that was it was the golden age of the Big East. But I was thinking about that when I watched UConn play Arizona the other day because Sean Miller is the coach of Arizona, and he's one of those guys, I swear, he was in college for 15 years. Yeah. I swear he played at Pitt from my freshman year in high school until five years after I graduated college. Right. It seemed like he was there forever and ever. And I'm like, oh, yeah, Sean Miller, remember when he played at Pitt forever? And, you don't have that anymore with these guys. These guys are one and done. You don't get to know any of them. None of the names ring a bell. When they yeah. had National Player of the Year candidates the other day, I mean, I knew of Kemba Walker from living in Connecticut and, and Nolan Smith or whatever, the guy, at, at Duke, the kid at Duke. But the rest of these guys, and you never hear, I'd never heard of them before. And Kemba and Jimmer Fredette are two examples Jimmer, of guys. Yeah. They stayed the extra year. Yeah. And it really helped them. <laughs> There's no there's no real incentive for these guys. Why would they stay? And it's not like they're going to graduate anyway. I don't get it, and I don't understand why nobody cares. I mean, it's fine if we just want to admit that, you know, graduation rates don't matter, and none of this stuffs matter. Then then fine, do it that way, and and just call it what it is. It's a business, but don't also try to quote unquote pretend you're educating these kids because nobody really that's not a priority. It's almost like it's just a minor league where it's associated with the college. Yeah. But, like, those guys are no more tied into a real collegiate academic experience than, I mean, it's a farce. So Jim Calhoun signed a five-year, $13 million deal. Sure. But, and the but that also, that doesn't count. He probably has a shoe contract, right? Yeah, he's got all these coaches have private deals with the shoe companies. They have a deal with Nike. Does he have one of those terrible local Hartford chefs? <clears throat> no, he doesn't. No, unless there's one on the. Well, he, I'm not sure. I don't really watch many of their locally televised games. There may be like a coach's corner deal before the game. Mm -hmm. I bet that's riveting to watch. He's <laughs> Mr. <laughs> yeah. Friendly what doing TV. The reporter. Well, that one's all script. Probably if there is one, it's all scripted. So he doesn't snap at those questions. <laughs> He's he like the only part of a of a bar here in Hartford called Coaches, but he got out of that. Oh, I've, I've been to Coaches. <laughs> that's right. You and I. You've have taken to me to Coaches. And now, ironically, there still is a Coaches, but. It's down the street from where it was, and he's not affiliated with it. Somebody just bought the rights to the name coaches. So, the uh, the good like son, the new Miami Vice movie, but. the good son scenario. You, it, it's on a cliff, and you have to save one. Gino Ariam or Jim Calhoun? You're, oh. They're dangling. You're holding them. Who do you save? Uh, I would take Calhoun over Gino. Yeah, because he's wow. just. I mean, at least Calhoun is arrogant. And has a fiefdom, but it's in men's basketball. And you could almost justify his ridiculous salary because right. I'm sure the men's team generates revenue. But only in this state, where one of two states in the union, Tennessee being the other, where people actually care about women's basketball. And it's a, it's a small subset, but it's a vocal subset here in Connecticut of people that, that like and follow women's basketball. So Gino, to be as imperious and arrogant as he is, and have his fiefdom that he is like, you know, so proud of is is just like he ought to be the most humble guy in the world and say like I won the lottery basically, yeah, because I ended up in Connecticut if, as a women's basketball coach and and I get the same salary as Calhoun he gets somewhere in the two million dollar a year range too, yeah, and they probably generate about forty seven cents in in revenue for the school. I like when he got mad that they didn't sell out the uh -huh. uh, the tournament game. 
so great. And it was so classic because he, I mean, instead of being thankful that they have a fan base here, as I said on Twitter, he should be happy there was 5,700 people there. Because yeah. in the other 48 states, he'd be lucky if there was 700 people there. Right. Instead, he comes out and and yells at the fans for not being supportive enough. And then Scholten. he says, well, maybe we shouldn't bid on the NCAA tournament anymore because we're, like, too spoiled. Mm. I mean, they win every game by 50 points. I don't know how you could be interested at this point. Uh, it's fun to go to an 84-42 to college, women's college basketball game. <laughs> I, I can't like get enough of it. That's my, that's my DVR right now is just blowouts from women's <laughs> basketball. I kind of enjoyed Gino a little bit uh, up until this year because I liked his Pat Summit feud. Yeah, and that's you can tell like they hate each other. Game. And, and uh, I the the people that he's recruited, you know, like I like Tarasi, I like Rebecca Lobo, Maya Moore. Like it's like I, that would be the team that if I was in a women's college basketball, I would be like, all right, at least those guys are doing something right. But then this year. Yeah. With the streak. Oh. When they when people are comparing it to the men's college streak and oh they're gonna pass UCLA and it's like Right. That's when it be that's when it just became crazy. And he came out and was like, Oh, oh the whole country's having a heart attack about this because they're so against us wanting to do it and really America had a collective shrug and ambivalence that was deafening. America's like, Wait, what are we having a heart attack about? Can you fill me in? <laughs> Exactly. I mean, I think I'm not a psychiatrist, but just watching from afar, I think a lot of his like, uh, you know, bragging and boastfulness and his general demeanor is 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 defensive in nature. Because he's a women's college because basketball he's a coach. Women's coach, exactly. Yeah. And he think I mean, he really thinks that he could like if he, you know, there's always rumors about or talks about oh, could he go coach in the men's game? And yeah, I don't think that he would ever deign to take like a Providence job mm. or even like a Boston College. I really think like he he thinks in his mind that he should be like the successor to Mike Shashevsky. So I think that he comes Duke? defensively because people are like, oh yeah, he's a good coach. And then there's always a but, but it's in women's basketball. Well, and he really thinks he should be up there with the Shashevskys and the Knights and the and the you know John Woodens. But of the, world. the the big issue is that there just aren't a lot of big women's programs. Right. So how hard can recruiting be when there's really like what three good ones in the country? Every year he gets whoever you know he gets one of whoever the best three people are. It's just a lock. He's going to get one of them. Pat Simmons going to get one of the other ones, and then the third one will go wherever. But when you have that kind of advantage, like I, I would actually think you would have a streak like 90 wins in a row. Yeah, it would be hard not to. And that's, I mean, in a couple of years, I thought he was really disgraceful a couple of years ago when, when they had this big-time recruit, Elena Della Don or something from Delaware. Yeah. And she was like the number one prospect in the country or something. Lived, only in Connecticut would I know who the number one women's prospect is, but you can't get away <laughs> from it. So she was like the number one women's prospect. She comes to UConn and they highly recruited her. She decides to come here and she didn't. She didn't like it here. She apparently had a sister at, back at home who was disabled, who she was very close to, and she didn't like being far away from her. And she had like some social anxiety or something. She didn't like being away from home, so she bagged UConn and goes back to Delaware. You know, you could say, well, that's the one that got away. He, like, threw under the bus and did this, well, not everybody's strong enough to play here, and, like, just completely, like, oh, no. sort of savaged her after the fact. And I thought what was, like, a disgraceful fashion. Well, it's, it's not like she was only an 18-year-old girl. <laughs> exactly. Mm. Exactly. And, I mean, you know, he's he's got his hands on all kinds of things. He has a restaurant. I think it's either the Mohegan Sun or Foxwoods. And I was watching PBS about a month ago, and, a commercial came on for upcoming programs and there was a show on about his wife was going to be doing some sort of a cooking show and then he was going to appear on it to tell you wines to pair with your food because he has a vineyard where he sells like or he I don't know if he has a vineyard but he sells wine here in Connecticut Gino Oriema wine so he's one of these guys that's like he's got about 50 different operations going on in the state too mm. And yeah. the ridicu- I mean, the ridiculous thing is the coverage of the, that they get in the newspaper, probably because it's the only game in town. But, I mean, when UConn makes the final eight, they have font in the current that's reserved for, like, Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor. <laughs> President Kennedy shot in Dallas. UConn makes a lead eight. It was on the front page above the fold today. They had shown a picture of Oriyama with his, with his head in his hands. And I'm like, oh, my God, what happened? Did, like, somebody on the team die? And it was just that they struggled. They only won by five in their Sweet 16 game. Above the fold, front page. Not in the sports, the front page of the newspaper. So do you find that, like, in your circles of, of 
guys who graduated college a few years ago and watch sports. Like, did people actually watch the the UConn women? <laughs> well, ironically, I was at the mall yesterday at a Dick Sporting Goods looking at sneakers, and they had TVs in that section of the store, and there was like five people there, guys standing there watching the UConn Georgetown women's game. Now, guys I hang out with are not really into it, and we all joke around about it. But there are guys in the state, I mean, I'll come to work, and it's older guys that will, like, break down the games for me over the weekend. Like, expect me to do like analyze last night's game, and then talk to me for about it for about five minutes. I'm going to defend women's college basketball for a second. Fundamentals, it's old school, it's the way it used to be. No, I mean, dramatic pause. (laughs) So you didn't let my dramatic pause be enough. I'm sorry. When we were at Holy Cross, yeah, and the Holy Cross women made their dramatic run to I think the final eight. <laughs> was there a book written about that as well? I don't think they. I don't think that book was written. The, <laughs> the author was saving himself for the UConn thing. That's the book you should have written when we were in college. I should have. Well, I remember. I, I, there's a couple columns I wrote for the Crusaders about that. <laughs> the Crusader about that team. Uh, it was awesome that that whole like when uh, when that team made the run and. Because we knew the girl, we knew the girls on it. They were all cool. The coach was awesome. He still coaches. Billy Gibbons the way. still coaching. Love that guy. Uh, and that was a time when um, you know there was a real disparity between women's sports and men's sports. And uh, and I don't know. I felt like that meant something to the campus when that happened. You were there. Mm. You're probably you're probably on Carroll Street. And- <laughs> I'm gonna be honest with you. I don't remember it meaning much to me. I'm not gonna lie to you. <laughs> I, didn't, I didn't say I didn't say everybody, but uh, I I, I like it. Reminded me of it. I'm not sure I remembered it quite frankly. And I do think, like when you look at the way men's college basketball is going, when all these one and out schools, and at least like with the women, like you talked about the continuity and the lack of continuity with men's, mm, right. At least with the woman, there is continuity. And, like, Maya Moore feels like she's been in college for 40 years. Yeah, but, she, she has been there for four years, yeah. But you have the same coaches. They don't skip around. True. You have the players that don't really go anywhere. And, you know, I, I, I've had to really look deep inside my soul here because my daughter is, is a good athlete, and i got to figure out, like, yeah. I might be going to a lot of these games. So and I gotta you be like careful basketball. With, <laughs> I, might, I might be going to about 100 women's college <laughs> basketball games someday. I don't know. <laughs> But, uh, well, I mean, it's it's last year. Was it last year? I think it was last year. Hartford hosted the. I forgot if it hosted the Big East, uh, Big East Championship, or if it was the early rounds of the NCAA tournament. I can't remember which, but yeah, I remember there was a happy hour after work, and I I went out to oh, it no. after work, and uh, not surprisingly, and I was downtown, and I'm like, my God, what is it? Am I in like Florida? It's like everybody down here is like 75 or 80, the median age. I'm like, what the hell's going on downtown? And then somebody said to me, oh, it's the Women's Big East or Women's NCAA Tournament. And oh. I'm like, oh, no wonder, because senior citizens love it, because it's like the game was played back in the 50s or the early 60s. You know, yeah. it's fundamentals, you know, set shots, no dunking. So well, it also back, like, harkens back to a simpler time. And also with uh, with men's college basketball, the quality of play has dropped. You know, and now oh, yeah. saying, it, some of these games are pretty tough to watch, and it's like... Teams run a play. If it doesn't work, then they run the point guard dribbles at the top of the behind the three point line for ten seconds. Somebody sets him a pick and he jacks up a three, and that's the offense. Right, because well, the good the good ones leave early for the NBA, I guess. Yeah. So guys that are left, you know, don't have the same skill set. I'm amazed by uh, you know, there's a reason ESPN is showing all these women's games. They rate. Do they? they do well, yeah. Well, maybe, maybe people my watch. Their comments about them not generating revenue. Maybe that was wrong. Well, I th- I think. Uh, your point about going to see a 40-point blowout, that when you're absolutely positive one team is going to win by 40 points, that's not really a draw on a no. Thursday night. And I don't really know what the solution is for that. But let's go back to Gino Ariema for a second. All right. What what would he have to do to get fired? Like, let's say, like, let's say there was a recruiting scandal that was on par with what happened to Bruce Pearl. Does he get fired? No. He, no, my God, no. I, honest to God, I'm, I'm not. I'm only half kidding. He'd have to kill somebody to get fired. Okay, how about video of he has a suitcase <laughs> and he's at I'm, some fast food restaurant. I'm getting restaurant. All excited about these scenarios. Just I know. I thought I thought it'd be like kind of porn for you almost. <laughs> yeah. The uh, a video. It's like a Jack in the Box. Do you have Jack in the Box in Connecticut? Um, I think so. I've never been to one, but maybe. Give me a fast food place. Um, Sonic. Yeah, we do have a Sonic. 
All right, there's a Sonic, Sonic like in, in Simsbury. <laughs> there's some security camera overhead. Gino comes in and he meets this recruit. He pulls out this suitcase and he opens it, and it's just $100 bills. It's just filled with $100 bills, and he gives it to her. No, and no she chance. walks in and leaves. They tape. They run in on Channel 3 on the news at, at 11 o'clock. No, no. He survives that. No, I think so, yeah. I don't really? think there's any question. Yeah. So you think he has a bigger foothold than Calhoun? Because I don't feel like Calhoun has a lot of bullets left in the gun here. Well, so part of it, too, is Calhoun's getting older. I don't think he quite has the same fire. He's been around a while. So they could, you know, he's, he's up in his 70s, I think. So they could sort of do the graceful exit with him. See, I have a soft spot with Calhoun that 68. Year. He's 68 years old, Joe Meade says. Thanks, Joe. I have a soft spot for Calhoun crazy. because he was Reggie Lewis's college coach. Yeah, and he's so a, I'm Boston, always, he always he's says a Boston guy. Yeah. You know, I knew you would side with that. I, I'm not siding with it. I'm saying I have a soft spot for him, but I do think, like, here's what I want to see. Here, here's what the Hartford – hey, Hartford Current, you want to stay in business and generate more, uh, more, more paper sales, all that stuff? you got to have an antagonist going to these press conferences. Yes, I agree. There's guy. Remember that one time the guy dared to start stuff with Calhoun. Yeah, that's Who was when the that guy, guy was like, "Are you going to give any money back?" And that's when Calhoun did the not one dime, and the guy like you know sort of fought back a little bit. Calhoun yeah, didn't remember care for that? He was like, "Shut up!" And the media went crazy. Remember, every turned on him. Yeah, a little bit. See, the difference was that guy wasn't really a reporter. He's like this activist. He's like a uh, Green Party activist. So they were like, they started to question the guy's like press credential because he was there for like a, you know, free alternative weekly. So it wasn't like it was a member of the of the brotherhood or the sisterhood of reporters. So does it sound like is there, is there a Yukon blog out there, a good one? Well, I don't know. I mean, there's you know, there's Yukon ones where they cover the you know cover the team through the current. But I mean, I don't, I don't. I'm not into it enough to really know if there's like a Yukon underground blog that's critical of them or anything. So the the move if you're like in a you know, I always get emails all the time, how do I how do I get into sports writing? Do you have any advice mm. on that stuff? And it's that's an impossible question to answer. The only thing you can really do is just work your butt off, read as much as you can, write as much as you can, so on. But you have to also look for the voids that are out there. And to me, the void that's out there because I've never seen this blog, is somebody that immerses himself into this whole Yukon men and women scene and goes to the games and writes good stuff about it and actually gets credentials and goes to the press conferences and gets tough with, with Gino and, and Calhoun in a good way. Not, in a, not in a poop-stirring way, in a good way. I don't think in Connecticut, though, there'd be a market for that because I don't think people, I think people wear rose-colored glasses when it comes to them and they're happy with the success. And I don't think there would be a market for anything that challenged that. I don't think they want the rose-colored glasses removed. I think they like do, the way it is. They want to have a big parade next month or two parades, which is what we'll have, by the way. We'll have a big parade for the men's and women's team. that will get, like, you know, 100,000 people in the streets of Hartford. So do you think Gino? because now they're both, well, the men are in the Final Four. The yeah. women are headed toward the Final Four. Yeah, that's a layup. So you think Gino secretly is, like, He's probably having people over to root against Calhoun in the Final Four, right? Oh, no question. I mean, they yeah. hate each other. For years, yeah. they didn't. They, for a while, they didn't speak. Now, they there was some sort of a piece that was allegedly. Why would they hate each other? What would be the genesis of that? Well, because it's all arrogance, and they, they both want to be the big man on campus. And Calhoun made some snide comment once about. Oh. He's like for the women's game. He's like, it's. He's like we should have a daycare center or a senior center because he's like everybody at the games was either like eighty or five months old. No, he said that. Something along those lines. I don't have. It's, I'm paraphrasing, but it was something along those lines. Joe Mead, will you Google their feud as we're talking? Sure. It's actually wow. there was a Sports Illustrated article about it a few years ago about how they were they didn't really get along and they had that quote was the, was one of the Genesis. What's the plural of Genesis? Genesee. One of the Genesees of it. <laughs> <laughs> it's great. So if they if the feud rekindled, so it sounds like you're on the couch. Oh, I think side. it's like simmering. I mean, I don't think they're they don't go out to dinner together. They're not warm and fuzzy. Like if they walk in the hallway, there might be like a snarled high at each other, but they're not going out of their way to like praise the other one or or you know you know if they appear on stage together at a at a parade or whatever a rally. I don't. I don't they're not warm and fuzzy. I'm reading some some article on Google that I just Googled where it said, as far as feuds go, this one was particularly delicious. Yes. Each seemed to take a great delight in tweaking the other. 
Mm. Oh, yeah, he's openly rooting for Kentucky Oriema. Calhoun complained about the inequity of the fans' demands, constantly pointing out that Oriema had a much easier time maintaining dominance in a sport where the gap between the top teams and everyone else was cavernous. Yeah. He used to say his program was unfairly burdened by having to generate the revenue for both teams. <laughs> it's Calhoun's thin skin, so he's going to be defensive. Oriema responded by rolling his eyes, shaking his head, and mumbling the confidence that Calhoun was insecure. See? There you go. This was in uh, the Seattle Times. J- uh, Les Carpenter. Anyway, uh, I like it. I wish they would feel... You know, to be honest, a feud would be better for both of them, wouldn't it? I mean, it's like East Coast, West Coast rap war, basically. It's going to just get both programs more attention. <laughs> Pretty much. The fans don't care for it because they like to think that, you know, everything's just wonderful in Yukon land and everybody loves everybody. God, you're making it sound like a, like a Scientology center or something. I'm telling you, it is. It's what it's like. It, it really is. I mean, it's like literally people, you come into work and people will be like, did you watch the game last night? The game. Well, there was a lot of games last night. <laughs> Can you be more specific? It's like you just should absolutely know that it's, they're talking about Yukon. I mean, people... People that went to different colleges, that it's just like a religion here in Connecticut. And part of that is probably, you know, it's probably like being in Nebraska, like a Nebraska football thing. Yeah. Or some, I'm trying to think of some state that doesn't have pro sports but has like a good college program. Um, you know, Nebraska is probably as good an example as anybody. You know, the did you watch the game? Which so one? let's well, let's fast forward to this weekend. UConn wins the title on Sunday. Uh, the, the other the other UConn wins the title on Monday. No, I think it would be Monday and Tuesday. Don't they play the women's one on Tuesday? Oh, do they? Joe Mead, do they do, is it Tuesday or Sunday? Tuesday sounds right, but I have to look it up. All right, well, whatever. In twenty in a 24-hour span, you could have two straight UConn titles. Do you go to work the next day? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, because you know why? Because it's not like a Yankees-Red Sox deal where I, I wave my Yankees allegiance openly yeah. and proudly. I keep my UConn bitterness under wraps, except for the, those closest to me, because I literally don't want to be like run out of the state on a rail. Hmm. My family, my loved ones, my friends lived here, so I kind of keep that on the down low. You're like a rogue. You're like the uh, one of the others and lost. <laughs> I, am. I I try to let them think I'm drinking the Kool Aid, but I'm really not. But really, you're plotting to take down both programs. Yeah, I mean, I'll come in wearing my Maya Moore jersey just to you know keep up appearances. <laughs> If there's a photo of that, I'd love to see it. <laughs> well, just uh, before we move on to the Yankees and Red Sox quickly, uh, I just want to point out to everybody out there that it is a free country, and Jacko is allowed to have his opinions about UConn basketball, and freedom of speech is allowed. And uh, <laughs> and I don't think it's fair that if somebody has opinions, they have to get dragged over the raked over the coals on a message board for. <laughs> 1,500 posts, which is probably going to happen here anyway. Yeah, it's fine. I just want to point out, it's a, it's a free country. I'm a big boy. I can take it. It's fine. He's, he's put some thoughts in his opinions, and those are his opinions. And, I mean, here's, here's, the, here's the segue for you. Moreover, as I tweeted last night, you know, one of my the weird sports factoids that I like is the Kentucky Yankees one. Yeah. Because the University of Kentucky has won the NCAA championship seven times since 1949, 1948. Uh-huh. I don't like where this is going. The last six times they've won it, dating back to 1949, when they have won the championship, the Yankees have won the World Series. Oh, no. 1949, 51, even like weird years like 78, they didn't win the championship from 78 until 96. Coincidentally, yeah. the Yankees won in 78 and then again in 96. And they last like won that. it in 98 when the Yankees won it. I don't like this, Jeff. So I'll, I have all the more incentive to root for Kentucky. Because one, I want them to beat UConn, and two, I want this weird. See if this weird Yankees thing can follow suit. So here's where I stand with the Yankees and the Red Sox. I'm yeah. a little concerned. You're because, a little concerned. Well, the Red Sox have had such a good spring training, and the optimism is so high right now. Yeah. And even in Vegas, you look at Vegas. Yeah. Red Sox are minus 175 to win the AL East. Yeah. The Yankees are like plus 160 or plus 180, something okay. like that. Okay. Wow. Uh, People, the the consensus seems to be the Yankees. They didn't do anything this winter. Right. They screwed up. They should have put Nunez. Or they should have trumped Texas in the Cliff Lee deal. They could have done more. Mm. If they got Cliff Lee, they win the World Series. He's still on the team. They messed up. Mm. Team's getting old. Jeter and A-Rod. Mm. 
They don't have a fourth and fifth starter. Mm-hmm. Rivera's going to go down at some point. Soriano is a setup guy, not going to work. He's a closer, mm-hmm. et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And I look at their team and I think, if Ivan Nova pitches well, mm. yeah, they're going to be fine. They're going to get to 100 wins. Well, they're, they're, I mean, I don't know. I mean, I, I, I got to say, I don't hate, like, sort of the Yankees lying in the weeds. You know, everybody thinks they're over the hill and they're shot. Oh, I hate it. <laughs> And I kind of like the Red Sox fan who's already basically booking his tickets to the World Series. I don't like that fan at all. Because there's nowhere for them to go but down because the expectations are so high, as well they should be when you spend half a billion dollars in the course of five days. Okay, Pat. <laughs> exactly. Uh, when you go out and spend that, your expectations should be high. So I, I think it's great. But, you know, I, I don't like to say this because it'll be the opposite of a reverse jinx, just a jinx, I guess. But, you know, there's some cracks in the armor of the juggernaut in the Red Sox if you look at spring training. I mean, I think you got some questions in that rotation. Well, we Beckett is not throwing like he did. I mean, he's. Oh, his, I saw his stats the other day, and I realized it's spring training, and you try different things, but he had an ERA of like seven, six and a half, I think. He's talking a big game about a big year for him, and it's not having spring training, spring training, whatever, but... Lackey to me is somebody you look at and it's like, all right, that guy lost a ton of weight. He, which, which by the way is always fun when the guy signs a ninety million dollar contract or whatever it was, and then he's like, yeah, I lost thirty pounds for year two of this contract. Oh, good, good. I'm glad you didn't lose that weight last year when you when you murdered our season. <laughs> when you're big and fat and you couldn't get out of the sixth inning ever. Well, it's kind of like Teixeira, who I saw. They said this year he really wants to work on having a hot start instead of his usual cold start. Thanks, Mark. Hey, thank you. Yeah, let's do, let's for do that, your progress. Yeah. <laughs> they, well, yeah, I mean, I'm with you on the Beckett thing. I think Lackey is going to be good. Buck Colts was pretty lucky last year, if you look at the advanced stats. You're right. That worries me. And then... Um, How about Papelbon? Well, we we had this bullpen where he's he he's either the third or the fourth best reliever in the bullpen, depending on how you feel about Dan Wheeler. <laughs> right, that's a little nerve wracking. And he's your closer, right out of the you know to start out of the gate. I think they trade him though. I think he's a te- I think that's a Texas trade waiting to happen. And this, what, from what I've read about him, he's had a terrible spring where his fastball is not that fast and it's pretty no. straight. He's well, he wasn't great last year either. No, I know. I mean, I, I just think there's some question marks. The thing that worries me the most, and they just and you just pencil in Euclid and Petroya coming back from pretty serious injuries, like they'll just be fine. Wow, I don't know. I think they'll be fine. I'm a little, and I, and I'm even more worried now that I spent thirty three dollars on them in our AL Keeper League yesterday. But the Gonzalez shoulder sh- surgery coming back thing, like him not hitting a homer until the end of spring training, basically worries me a tiny bit. And he didn't. He couldn't even hit in the beginning until he. It wasn't until like a couple of weeks in that he could even hit off a tee. Because they're going to announce this extension right after opening day for 155 million or whatever it is. A lot riding on that shoulder. Well, he, you know, if, if we get into May and he's got one homer and he's, you know, got the uh, 780 OPS, I think, and the Yankees, you know, jump out of the gate, et cetera, et cetera. I I don't know if that's going to go. I I don't think he'll have a ton of leeway in Boston. No, and it, it'll be interesting to see him in a different, in a big, in a city where they care about it now and. His every move is watched. I personally think, I think he's going to kill I think it. Cole Crawford's already getting a little prickly with the media. Well, I think Gonzalez is going to kill it. I, it just seems like he's been waiting his whole career to play in a situation like this, like in front of a packed house every night, and everybody says he's going to kill that park. Yeah, it definitely helps. If you can hit 40 home runs at Petco or whatever they call it these days, Fenway is an improvement. But what do you think of Ivan Nova? <laughs> Excuse me, what's that? What do you think of Ivan Nova? Well, he's been good in the spring. I mean, he was decent in flashes last year when they brought him up at the end. Is it a, or is it Ivan Nova? I, I think it's Ivan. Yeah, it's I've Ivan. I, I always do that with the Ivan Ivan thing. Uh, we dra- we drafted him, drafted him for seven dollars, huh? No, it's good to see him give a young guy a shot. I wanted Cliff Lee there, but I'll roll the dice with Ivan Nova. I like him; he's got a live arm. Yeah, but you have the thing that happened with the Yankees is Benuela Benuelelos. Like it's four Benuelos. syllables, some eight letters, four syllables, and I have no shot at saying it. <laughs> Benue- I call him Benuelos, but it's Benuelelos or something. And you took Spanish too. You should. I know. Be I can't pronunci- do it. Better at pronouncing this. But that guy skyrocketed this year, and that is your Liriano Felix piece. Yeah. If you want it. Yeah. They all. Yeah. Definitely. So I don't think to, the Yankees just have to tread water to the All Star break, basically, and then they, you know they're seeing where they are. I mean, if they're if the Red Sox are 
15 games up, you're probably not going to do anything. But if it's if it's nip and tuck, and the Yankees have you know held their own with a terrible back of the end, uh, back end of the rotation, they're gonna they're gonna make a move. Hopefully, you know the twi- you know somebody's gonna be out of it. The Twins will be looking to deal, or maybe the Mariners with Felix the Cat. From my mouth to God's ears. Um, I think it's going to be Felix, and here's why: because they have this guy Michael Pineda. Mm-hmm. who we ended up spending $16 on because we had our heart set on him as the number one pick, and he pitched so well that they actually decided to screw the extra arbitration here and just have him make the team. Right off, right off spring training. So if you have him and you have Benuelos, mm. I said it correctly. Yeah, you got something for the future. And that's your one-two in Safeco. Yeah. You're in Safeco field with, like, two of the best young pitchers in either league. Mm-hmm. That's pretty nice if you're the Mariners. And, and you stink and, anyway, so you're going to stink with them, or stink with them, or stick with stink without them. So what's you the can difference? sell that to your fans. Yeah, no, you can't tell that, but you just say you do the we're building for the future deal. No, I'm saying I'm saying you could you could <laughs> tell your fans. Hey, oh, we stink with them. Why we can stink without them? Yeah, Felix. Hey, how many how many playoff games do you remember Felix pitching? We couldn't make it with him. You know, we screwed up. We missed our window. He's going to sign for 150 million with somebody. We can't afford it. And we're going to go in this direction. So I, I do think you're going to end up with Felix or Liriano, in my opinion. <coughs> but, and then, uh, you know, the other thing that's going on is this A-Rod thing. Yeah, he's on fire. But Knock the body up. fat down? A body fat down to 3% or something I saw. Hitting bombs? That's right. What Joe Meade was killing the uh, the loving touch of Cameron Diaz. What do you think he was taking? What do you think he's taking? <laughs> A lot of vitamins. Too vitamins. soon. Good old-fashioned workouts. <laughs> we spent uh, thirty-two dollars on him. I have a Yankee. On my, I have two Yankees in my fantasy. A Rod. Yeah, I like. A-Rod. I love A Rod. I like him this year. Oh, I'm gonna send you his jersey. I like him. Nice. I think he's gonna have a huge year. Alex. You know, with, when great players, and you can, you can look at this, they always have. The, they'll set up. They'll have their prime. Then they'll kind of settle into that post-prime numbers, which he's done, which is pretty steadily 280, 400 on base, 30, mm-hmm. 35 homers. But they'll always have that one more great year. That's it. And this feels like this could be the year. And, and actually, Jeter's probably due for one of those where he just hits like 338 randomly. <clears throat> he's going to get the 3,000 hits this year. That's going to be a big deal. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he's also going to give up 3,000 in shortstop. <laughs> Come on. I'll talk about the captain. How are you feeling about like the park being filled and all that stuff? Because people aren't going to be pouring out for the second place Yankees. Um, I'm excited. I might be able to get tickets cheap. You think they <laughs> didn't knock the prices down? No, I don't know. I'm just saying if they can't fill it, there'll be some summer specials. Mm. I think this is going to be a good one. We might have to uh, have to talk to you a few times during the season, Johnny. Thanks, Bill. Thanks. Because. Uh, I think this is going to be. We could see both of these teams get get to 100 wins. It'd be interesting. Could be. Uh, could be nip and tuck. Because here's what else good. is they're, going on. They're armed and loaded, you know. Because Tampa got a lot worse. A lot worse. Yeah, and they're counting on Manny and Johnny Damon. I think those days might be past us. Well, you left out the the key guy that they're counting on. The one, the only, Mr. Kyle Farnsworth. Oh, that's right. <laughs> How could I forget? <laughs> it's a good idea to good idea to make him a closer in the AL East. That oh, should yikes. go well. Oh, bring him on, please. Plus, like, not just the Sox and the and the Yankees offenses, but the Orioles have, like, kind of that softball team type of feel this year. Yeah, they have Vladdy, right? Yeah, they got a lot of guys. They, that's going to be a lot of 10 to 8 games with them. And Showalter's uh, stirring the pot a little bit. Yeah. To say, hey, we're in, this, we're in this league, too. And then I think Toronto is going to be half decent, too, so it should be interesting. Uh, quick, Jersey Shore thoughts, anything? Season you know over? What? Happy with season three? The, I have not seen the entire finale. I've seen about half uh-huh. of it. I missed the second half of it. Oh. I haven't had a chance. My wife comes in and gives me dirty looks when she finds me watching the Jersey Shore. So, oh, she's out on it. What's that? She doesn't like the Jersey. She does Shore. not like the Jersey Shore. And it, I was watching it, and then she came into the room, and I had to stop watching it. So, so yeah. your plan of naming uh, your first kid Polly D O'Connell is not going to fly. Well, I'm going to I'm going to break some news now because, uh, as you know, my wife is pregnant. Yes. With an August due date, and mm. I was hoping that uh, it would be Derek Jeter O'Connell. Mm-hmm. But we have just learned that it's going to be Derek Ha. Derek Ha, Jeter O'Connell. Yeah, so speaking of women's basketball games in your future, I might be right there with you. Yeah, you see, it's going to change how you think about this I stuff, know. Johnny. I be, I, that Maya Moore jersey may not be a joke in a little while. How about Alexa Rodriguez O'Connell? Oh, that's good. Alexa. I like that. Alexa. Alexa O'Connell. That's not bad. Well, who are, A-Rock. 
<laughs> Rank your uh, top three favorite Yankees ever. My top three favorite Yankees ever? Yeah. Like, just in my lifetime that I You're saw just your play? favorite. You're your top three. Ever? Yeah. Oh, uh, well, Babe Ruth. No, in your, in your lifetime. Oh, in my lifetime. That's what I just asked you. You said, well, ever. Um, well, my favorite as a kid was Greg Nettles. Uh, I love Jeter. Jeter's probably my favorite that I've seen play. I'd say Jeter, Mattingly, Greg Nettles. Oh, Mattingly. So you could do a, is there a, you could do Donnie. You could kind of swing female. Mm. Donnie O'Connell. Nah, yeah, how about little... Mattingly? Maddie? Maddie o- Mattingly, Jeter, O'Connell. Hmm. I, I'm going to think maybe the readers will have some yeah, suggestions. I have some tweets on this. Yeah. I don't think Derica has a good ring to it. And, and uh, well, My wife's name is Erica, so that would be awkward. Yeah, that would be tough, Derica. too. Uh, yeah, I don't like the rhyming stuff. But uh, G- Jeter could be interesting. Jeter would be good. Hmm. I'm going to think about it. Alexa is like the leader in the clubhouse. I really like A-Rock. <laughs> Alexa Rodriguez O'Connell, A-Rock. I do like that. That may be her nickname regardless. Uh, I can't wait until uh, until you have this kid and I'm getting the phone calls like, why didn't you tell me? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Get your sleep now, Jenny. Yeah, absolutely. Luckily, I don't sleep anyway, so I'm, I'm always up early, so it's good. All right. Enjoy opening day. And, thanks, buddy. Uh, and we'll talk to you in a couple weeks. All right. All right. Thanks, buddy. All right. Very quickly, just because on the heels of the tournament, we got a little March Madness talk. So we got our Vegas expert, Chad Melman from ESPN the Magazine. Chad. How many times can Kansas kill a three-team parlay? Seriously, Kansas is just brutal. And it, honestly, so many favorites have been brutal yeah. this tournament. It's been – I'm astounded. Most parlays ever lost in a two-week span, you think? It in could teasers? be. I mean, that, and, and the books love that, by the way. When I was oh, in yeah. Vegas um, the first weekend of the tournament – I was talking to a bunch of bookmakers and asking them about, you know, because it was such a weird week that first weekend because a lot of favorites, I think favorites won the first day, dogs took the second day, favorites won the third day, and I think dogs took the fourth day. And so people are asking, are they winning money? Are they not winning money? And the key to any book making money is in the parlays because if one big favorite like Kansas or um, Pitt, you know, come, or Louisville, that you know, that first day, uh, if they end up losing, that kills so much parlay money across the day that even if the books aren't winning size, or if the wise guys are getting better than getting the better of the books, or you know, the favorites keep winning, so the squares keep winning. Um, if one or two big time favorites lose, that kills a lot of parlays, and that brings the money that brings the money in for the books. And I would think Pitt was even worse last week. Than this Kansas one, yeah, I mean, Kansas one was a high line. Well, you know, VCU and, and Butler are two such interesting teams because almost nobody is picking them when uh, the lines are coming out. Nobody is taking these teams because it just seems so surreal. The idea that these teams that have nobody, anybody has heard of, and VCU, which barely got into the tournament, and Butler, which needed to win the con- its own conference tournament to get into the tournament. It's like nobody has been picking these teams, especially from a wise guy perspective. Almost every guy I've spoken to has shied away from VCU. Only a couple guys have been on the Butler side for most games. And um, so, yeah, nobody. I mean, I know I, if I could have made a pick on that day, I would have picked Pitt. Well, and it, it, this is what I like and I don't like about the tournament at the same time. I love the fact that Butler is in the Final Four and that – Unlike the BCS and the whole thing, like there is some wackiness that could happen. But then you look at the fact that Butler's in the Final Four. I watched that Butler pick game. Butler should have lost. Yeah. Guy makes the second free throw, they lose. Guy doesn't foul, at least it goes in overtime, now it's a 50-50 chance. Like, you forget this now, and everybody's like, Brad Stevens, what a great job. And I agree, he's, he's an awesome coach. He's probably the best under-35 coach out there. But you just forget, like, it's really one or two plays sometimes, and the pit guy makes second free throw. They're out, and we're talking about, oh, pit. Could they get the monkey off their back? Well, absolutely, and that's what's amazing. Even Brad Stevens recognizes that. I think he said in one of his press conferences, he was like, look, we we won because we had the ball last in two of our games. Yeah. And so he's very aware of the limitations of his team and the vagaries of winning in the tournament and how lucky you get. But that's that's part of it, too. And And you could look at it the other way. Butler made its own luck. 
by being in a position to win those games because those were two games. I mean, ODU, you know, that was a tight game and, and that was a, uh, the spread in that game was never more than two. But against Pitt, certainly they put themselves in a position to win that game when they had no reason to win it. Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine with that part. I'm just talking from a pure gambling point. Yeah, well, from a gambling perspective, that's nothing but a, a kick in the gut. And this tournament has been full of kicks in the gut. I mean, you well, know. Can we say that it just might not make sense to bet on college basketball in the tournament? You certainly could, and I think that's why a lot of wise guys actually shy away from it, or at least they don't. They don't spend the same kind of money that they spend during the regular season when. Uh, their power ratings are more pure. They get a better chance to see these teams on a consistent basis. There's a lot less emotion involved. And yeah, home court, home court can sway a game. Home court can sway, like, but certainly the public perspective isn't as nearly as a factor as it is during the tournament. So the lines aren't moving as much, and it's their choice to play the lines or not. But they get involved at a lot lower prices than um, than they normally would during the regular season. But you know, just BYU. The, the guy makes it – from the first game they played to the game when they were knocked out, there were multiple times where they were on the the thinnest edge of that point spread uh, and ended up losing it every time for anybody who was Ugh. betting on BYU. It, it was it was gut-wrenching. It was so difficult to watch. The, the – when you talked about the bookies backing off – I mean, not the bookies, the, uh, the sharps backing off. That's actually even a double win for the books because now they just have dumb people betting on their games. <laughs> exactly. You're right. You're totally right. They've just got a lot of squares coming in and putting down money and, and sort of trying to use their knowledge of what they think they know from watching conference tournaments to make some coin. Although a couple guys mentioned to me that the, the way the games were spread out this year was actually, you know, over the four networks was actually a detriment to them. I, I'm curious to see uh, when this is all said and done what people estimate handled to be on the NCAA tournament because a lot of times these games were all going off at the same time instead of having them more staggered as they've been throughout the past couple of years. And yeah. so people might not have been betting as much because they normally would wait to see how they did in one game before they rolled that over into the next game. Ooh. And uh, with the games sort of all going off at the same time and not exactly knowing what you were winning and losing yet, I wonder if that impacted the way people uh, threw down their cash. That's my friend J-Bug. That's his pyramid scheme. The you win the early scheme. game, you put all the winnings on the late game. He does well, that football. How, but, that's how the books make money too. Is yeah. you know that's why they're taking J Bug's money is because oh. he's, he's the guy who goes on you know puts all his money on a Monday night game yeah. you know from the weekend and that's you know Monday night games are always the most heavily bet games because they're the last games and so catch people up want game. that one last chance to make their coin. What do the books not want us to do with March Madness? Win. Well, I mean, what's is there a strategy? Because if I would think it would be like betting bigger underdogs like. Throwing. Well, the books never want you to bet the underdogs because, uh, you know, it's like they, they win when you bet the favorites because they create the lines, you know, much more in tune to attract, at least in the tournament. You know, they're wary of, of wise guys for sure, and they're not going to do anything that leaves them ultimately very vulnerable to a wise guy play. Right. But, um, they're setting the lines thinking, what can we do to entice people to usually, you know, take the favorites because that's what people usually do. And so inevitably they need the underdogs. Now, is it shaded four points? No, it's usually half a point or a point. And if a wise guy uh, comes in and plays the other side, then the, then the lines immediately get tightened up. But, you know, mm. the, the books are always looking, thinking, all right, a square's coming in. They're going to play the favorites. Best future bet. <laughs> the worst future bet was the one Sal and I had, which was the over for Big East teams. What, that, was, what, uh, that was like being beaten with reeds for yeah. four straight days. The best bet was uh, if you had the under for number of one seeds that will make the tournament, which was Honestly, one and a half. Astonishing, isn't it? Yeah. It's a, and I remember we talked about this nine of the past ten years. It's been a one or a two seed that wins it all. Yeah. Now, Not this year. it's like... Uh, is there a one or a two seed left? No. no. UK, Kentucky's a four. UConn's a three. And then Butler's, what, an eighth? And VCU's an 11? That's, it, it has been 
a kick in the gut tournament every step of the way. And um, so the way to bet is just to take other people's bets. Is probably the way to go. Well, at the end of the day, you I mean it's it's yeah. best to be a bookie. <laughs> it's best that's, to make the lines. That's why they drive Lexuses. It's the uh, safest way to go. You know, you, in your excellent ESPN Insider column, you talk to a bunch of different sharps, and they give you their perspective. Who did the best this this, uh, this playoffs? God, nobody's done well. I mean, they have all gotten killed. It's like, really? Yeah, guys would make good picks about. Um, you know, uh, Jeff Kulesa, who runs uh, WonderdogSports.com or WonderDog.com, you know, he had a great pick with Florida State uh, beating Notre Dame. But um, the, other, the other side of his pick didn't do so well. You know, Teddy Covers in the first bracket got killed. Uh, all of, almost all of his picks were wrong, but he did make the right pick, taking Akron plus the points against Notre Dame. Um, this past weekend, Allen Boston – did a great job. He was all over Butler and um, saying that they they definitely cover this weekend. And um, he was all over uh, Arizona covering against UConn and actually calling the UConn win, but betting on Arizona. Uh, Paul Basir from Prediction Machine, who the newcomer, uh, he's a comer. You and I have spoken about him before. Um, he had a great run at the start on his sort of best picks. He was twelve and four. Then he tapered off over the weekend, but he still did pretty well. He, um, I think he had he had Florida over Butler, but he had uh, Arizona covering, and he had Kentucky covering. So do we, uh, do we need to start taking him seriously as a player because he killed it in the playoffs too? I think he, he went did. 11 he and did 0. really well in the playoffs, and he's done really well with his totals too. You in know, the NFL playoffs. What's that? In the NFL in playoffs, the NFL did playoffs. he go eleven and zero? Uh, I think he did go undefeated during the playoffs. Mm. And his, know, the, his the way he does it is he just he puts all the fa- all the different factors however he weighs it and just plays the game over and over. He plays it fifty thousand times. Fifty thousand times. And, and what was interesting about his um, I think it was his UConn uh, his UConn Arizona game. Uh, it was twenty five thousand twenty five thousand. He never had that happen before in college basketball. What do you mean? It, they played it fifty thousand times and each team won. Oh, it was dead even. Yeah, his daddy. Wow. I think that was the game. It was in one of the games that he talked about this weekend with oh me. Oh, my God. Uh, yeah, it was insane. He said it's never happened to him before. But it was an interesting thing. One of the tweets I got this weekend was, you know, they were commenting how a lot of the wise guys I spoke to were getting killed. And a lot of the guys I talked to are old-time Vegas, um, like, non-quant like quant guys. And then they ask about, you know, is are the quants taking over? And yeah. it's a question to be had you know are the quants doing any better than sort of the old time research it become a part of the team vegas guys and then boston goes out and you know he bests paul basier by picking butler and uh and zona against the spread so i think it's still there's a lot of uh merit in both sides right now i like that you're right in the middle between yep. between you got to uh... get all sides you got to get all the information in order to make the worst possible picks. Otherwise, you're not doing yourself any service. You're like, it's in, not, this is my second lost reference of the podcast. You missed the other one, but it's, you have the others and you have the old guard on the island who believe in the power of the island, and, and maybe, maybe neither of them are totally right. No one ever is. That's the problem. Is no one ever is, and you're only really, really good at this if you're winning 53% of the time. Well, you know what's right is not to bet on March Madness. I think that's the one lesson we we learn every year and that we forget. Yeah. Is that you're just you're not going to do well and you know most of the time whatever pool whatever pool you're in somebody who doesn't follow basketball that much is going to win it. It's like the old joke, but it's just it's a crapshoot. You just don't know. It is a total crapshoot, but it's still too much fun to ignore because these games there's so much excitement in these games and these you know at the end of the day they're kids and it's they're not professionals and so. Right. Everyone is subject to the emotions of the moment in a way they wouldn't be if they were 25, 26-year-old guys who got paid for a living doing this. I forget who had that famous quote once about gambling on college basketball that you're gambling on. You know, like I can't remember who said it, but it was like, remember what you were like at 19? Like, sure, but, would you have wanted anybody to bet on you from a day-to-day basis? Honestly, no. It's, whoever said that is a genius. Yeah. Maybe I should take credit for it. but You can it, steal it. It's totally, totally true. There's not a thing I would want someone to be putting money on that I was doing when I was 19 years old. You have some guy who's the best player on his team who the night before 
his girlfriend dumped him or he's, he went over to see his girlfriend or her old boyfriend was in the room. And this guy goes three for 20 the next day, and there's no way to even know. Yeah, it, well, you know what's funny is I have a buddy who's a college basketball coach who I, I saw a couple months ago. And uh, he's like, was getting, like, some, some scouts were coming to see one of his kids, and his team wasn't playing very well. And this one kid that he thought that was the best player on his team, he wanted these scouts to come see, and he's got a contract, and the team has to wear a certain color shoe. And the kid comes to the locker room that day, and he decides he's not going to wear the color shoe that he's supposed to wear with the oh, team. Right. And, the, and he says to the coach, uh, and the coach says to him, why aren't you wearing the shoes? And the guy goes, coach, these are my lucky shoes. I always play well with these shoes. And the coach says to him, dude, we're 0-7. How much, luckier do you think, <laughs> how much more luck do you think we need right now? And it's like the kid, just, his, his mind is not there, and he's constantly refereeing between kids who are making decisions about shoes based on luck, kids who are making decisions about, you know, this guy was sleeping with this guy's girlfriend, and now they're trying to be friends again for the better of the team. It's like you don't know what's going on in college basketball in a way that you do in, in pro sports. True. All right, Chad Millman, we will follow your column this week for final four picks. And you know what? Try to do some baseball over-unders for us one of these days. I did some baseball over-unders early in the year. You want me to do them again? You want me to run through them again? Do they, they, well, the season starts in four days. So I think you got to have a couple. Dude, I'm very busy. But I'll get – it's, it's actually on my Here's agenda. busy crap. Um, it's on my agenda for the week. I have a I, couple ideas I'm working out for this week. Something about maybe loss also because it's been such a difficult tournament for so many people. You know what's a really interesting bet? And I was looking at it, the uh, the who will have the most homers bet. Yeah. Because if you if you bang that out correctly, you, you can have somebody that you, you'll get the right odds on somebody that'll be like somewhere between plus 800 and plus 1500. That uh, it just doesn't seem like that that is even bet that much. Well, that, I haven't looked bet. yet. I haven't looked at the odds, but or recently I need to see where that kid Stanton from Florida is at, because he's the kind of guy that a lot of people talk about, like mm. he's getting buzz in that expert field, but I don't think he's surfaced with sort of the everyday square fan yet, so I'm curious to see what he's at, and then there's a bunch of other guys to sort of consider. Maybe that's what I should do as a... I like the homer bet. bet. You know what's great about that bet? It's so much fun to root for. Yes. I did it a lot, like probably 15 years ago once, and it's like that guy becomes your guy, and you're watching Sports Center, and he went deep twice a day. It's a good one. I noticed Adam Dunn was plus 600, and I could see, I like those are pretty solid odds. In my yeah, opinion. and Adam Dunn, you know he's going to be a player. You know he's going to be in it, and New you know he's going to be swinging to win it. There, there's League, no doubt. Excited. Yeah. So, and uh, and I also think A Rod. I forgot what A Rod's odds were, but. A Rod has one last big homer season in him, and he's been, like in phenomenal shape, all that stuff. But there's a few guys, but, but yeah, I, I day, demand a home run home run column. At the end of the day, do you want to spend your summer rooting for A Rod? Because that's I what mean, you ultimately have to do. It's a great question, but I mean, I would flip that around. It's kind of like you're you're kind of going to uh, some weird place that you never thought you'd be. Ooh, I'm happy like, when A Rod does it. <laughs> like the dark side. Dark side. <laughs> you can make your dark side prop bet. Dark side bet. Yeah, that'd be good. Dark side bets. Oh my god, that is a great idea. Plus, also, if you lose it, it's great because you've jinxed him completely. You know what? Yeah. I'm doing a dark side bet column this Do week. Do a dark side bet column. All right. I'm glad we. I'm glad something came out of this. Chad Bowman, talk to you soon. All right, brother. I'll talk to All you right, later. See you. Target the sound off. Whoa. Thank you for downloading the BS Report with Bill Simmons. Too much fun. Check out more podcasts at the iTunes Music Store or at PodCenter at ESPNRadio.com. Peace out.